Welcome to FT On Air from the Financial Times in London. Are you financially and emotionally prepared for the possibility that you could live until the age of 100? I'm Claire Barrett, FT Money Editor and editor of The Next Act, our new online hub for those in later life. Joining me now are London Business School professors Linda Grasson and Andrew Scott, the authors of this book, The 100 Year Life, Living and Working in the Age of Longevity, plus Lindsay Cook, the FT's money mentor columnist. You can ask us questions on Facebook throughout our discussion, share your comments and questions by just tapping below the line and I can see those on my iPad and put your questions to our panel. So for now, talking about the 100 year life, I'll read from the book, a child born in the West today has more than a 50% chance of living until the age of 105. For a child born a century ago in 1918, there was a 1% chance. So many of us are facing a working life which could span 60 or 70 years. Lord, this is a massive readjustment in terms of our working lives and careers, but also, as the money editor, to how we fund our retirement. So lots to talk about, but Linda, I'm going to start with the question, is living to 100 a gift or a curse? Well, you know, Claire, living to 100 is absolutely brilliant. Imagine all the things that you can do in 100 years. Uh, you can uh, take time out. You can spend more time with your, your children. You can learn. You can go back to university. Um, you can do more work. I, I think it's a fantastic gift. Well, I suppose one of the big swing factors um, will be how healthy um, you could remain for that 100 years and certainly in all of the, the debates we've been having in FT Money and Next Act, our new hub, um, about funding the cost of care in later life. This is something that can often frighten um, our readers but perhaps leaving the issue of, of health and investing in your health aside, there are many things um, that people need to change about their mindset when it comes to facing up that we will be around for longer and we'll probably need to work for longer too to have the money to do all of those lovely things that we want. Uh, absolutely. I, mean, I think you know, what we've got is we've got more time and your, your point about health is crucial. But what the data shows is on average we're living longer, we're healthier for longer and so we have the opportunity to do more things. There are more risks around that but we have to prepare and uh, our key thing is that we seem to have designed a three-stage life mm. based around a life expectancy that is no longer valid. So that's the reason why pensions are struggling at the moment, why education is set up to have a career of 30, 40 years, and why we're not well prepared to seize the opportunity of a 100-year life, or also make sure we minimise the risks. And Andrew, that three-stage life would start with university after school, so a period of, of, of education. then. A career. Now, I mean, we're already looking at people changing career paths yeah. during their lifetime. Now, perhaps the the old-fashioned idea of a career was, you know, a job for life, perhaps with a, a, a copper-bottomed final salary pension, and then th this idea of of retirement. And I think that what I've really learned through editing the the next act section on ft.com is that people, especially FT readers, you know, you don't want to stop. You don't want to just hang up your hat um, at the age mm. of, of sixty or sixty-five. Um, and cease to be a, a, a professional, you know, you either want to do something different or something you've always dreamed of. No, I mean, the, the idea of retirement is a, a hard stop at the same age that everyone does is already gone. I mean, you look at the numbers of people working beyond 65, they're looking to do different things, they're looking to either carry on working full-time in their existing role, shift to something more flexible, do something they've always wanted to do, do something with a social purpose, and they're doing it in lots of different ways at different times and with different options. But you know, the challenge, Claire, really here is that we may want, I speak as a 63-year-old, we may want to go on forever, but in fact, there's a big lag, both in terms of how our corporations are structured, mm -hmm. how work is structured, but also how we think about people who are over 60. Um, so, you know, it's really fascinating when we looked at, uh, you know, if you bring the, the retirement age, uh, if you increase it, what happens? Well, actually, it doesn't really make much difference because the truth is most people want to work, but they can't. Their organisation doesn't allow them to. So really, we believe it's absolutely crucial. We talk about this in our next book. It's absolutely crucial that organisations also change. They change their really uh, awful stereotypes about what it is to be a 55-year-old and what it is to be a 60-year-old. Well, exactly. If you're watching this live on Facebook, 
maybe you've got an experience that you'd like to tell us about or something that you'd like to ask Linda about that very subject of like wanting to work for longer but finding that your employer or um, people who you're trying to get work with um, are discriminating against you on the basis of, of age. I think that's a, a topic we'll definitely come back to in a minute. For now, I'm just going to read out some comments that we've got from readers. I said, are you prepared to live to 100? Our reader, L Luke Hornblower, says, no, I am not prepared. <laughs> OK, well, Luke, keep watching. We'll give you some ideas. Um, Serville Marrow says, I'm only prepared if I can afford living and the place where I live should be equally desirable for me. Well, an interesting mm. housing point, which we'll come on to with Lindsay in a second. Ray Dunkel says, I am prepared to live up to the age of 100, but I am not prepared to work up to the age of 87 till I get a thank you token to my local supermarket <laughs> <laughs> instead of a pension. Well, let's hope that you can do um, a bit better than that, Ray. And finally, Mazam Kali Khalil says, I am emotionally prepared, yes, but financially, no. Interesting and a great um, point at which to bring Lindsay Cook, our money mentor, into the discussion. So um, you write about all kinds of issues for FT Money and for Next Act, our new online hub, for those in later life. But one thing in particular that is facing today's um, retirees more than it has done the previous generation is whether they will run out of money because of the way that pensions have changed, especially for professional workers. Absolutely. Um Everybody used to have final salary pensions and they would know that they were going to retire on half or two-thirds of their income and they could plan. Now, the last 20, 30 years, most private companies or quoted companies have gone to um, defined contribution, which means all the risk is with the employee. Employment doesn't go on forever. You don't have a 40-year career. and. An awful lot of people are let go in their 50s well, and, yes. they, and they end up being self-employed, often working for the same corporation but on a freelance basis, earning less and with no pension. And I come across a lot of people who are very worried about, they, they've said, oh, I, I put my 50s aside for building up my pension mm. and now I can't. And they've got their children in education or needing help with housing. They might be looking after their own parents. and. Now it is frightening to know that the average pension pot at retirement is about 50,000. That sounds bad. For women, it's under 30,000. For men, it's about 75,000. You don't get much for your, your money when you've got that sort of money. No, and uh, using an annuity at the age of 65, I think, to convert a pension of that, you know, you're, you're not going to be left with uh, much more than 10 to 15,000 a year if you're Oh, no, 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 a lot lucky. less than that. A yeah, lot less a than lot that. Less. Yes. Yeah. So, um, the, the state pension, we've got a new flat level state pension, 35 years, and you're supposed to get 8,500 a year, but only about half the people qualify, so that's another thing. I mean, national insurance needs to be re resolved so that if you want to work longer, probably pay national insurance longer, but instead of paying, getting 35 tokens towards your pension, being able to get 40, 45 tokens mm. and get a bigger pension out of it. Mm. All those things, it's access to pensions after a certain age that is one of the big problems. Mm. Mm. Equity release is a, an area that is has a bad reputation, but I can see that needs to be reformed so that people, particularly in the southeast, who've got a decent home, can start to use that to live on and although it's got a bad reputation, I only hear a complaints from nephews and nieces, not from children. Well, it's, yes. <laughs> it, it, the children say, oh, mum and dad, you earned it. You should yeah. use the equity. Um, and it's been discussed. Nephews and nieces are looking at Auntie up the hill and thinking they're going to be rich <laughs> later. Well, one of the uh, phrases that you mention um, in your book is, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Uh, which I, I, I really like that. It's got you know some some lessons we can we can learn it. I mean, when it comes to mm -hmm. to pensions and saving for retirement, the message you know unfortunately is start earlier. Your savings will have longer to mm -hmm. compound, um, and also the sooner you get into the savings habit, the easier it will be mm -hmm. to increase the level um, of your savings year after year. But it's not just the money yeah. that we have to yeah. plan. It's also how we're go on to earn the money because we won't be able to necessarily do the same job um, yeah. for the duration of a 50, well, I, 60, you know, I think, I think I went, when Andrew and I wrote the book, one of our m big insights was that, of course, money is really important and we, you know, there's no question of that. But actually, intangible assets 
are also absolutely crucial. And we spent quite a bit of time working out what those were. We thought that your intangible assets were things like what helps you to be productive, um, what helps you to keep vital in terms of your energy and so on. And thirdly, what helps you to transform yourself. And in fact, if you go onto our website, www.100yearlife.com, uh, you can fill in a diagnostic that helps you to work out wh what you're doing on that. And at London Business mm -hmm. School with our MBA students, I run a program on the future of work. And we ask all of them over a week to start planning their future. And to ask, we, I basically ask each one of them, what are you doing now? to build your intangible assets? What are you doing now to remain productive, which is really about life, lifelong learning? What are you doing now to keep healthy and keep your relationships strong? And how are you learning to transform yourself? And I have to say, and, 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 and Andrew and I are working on the next book at the moment, for me, the real uh, eye-opener in working in this field is lifelong learning, upskilling, reskilling, right the way through your life. I think it's going to be absolutely crucial, again, uh, education institutions, including ours, are not ready for that, but that will happen. And I think if there's one thing I would like to say to the, those who are watching now is definitely, definitely think about the money, but also think about your skills and your own capacity to be productive. Because you know, if you're 55 year old, 55, uh, but and you have skills, you you can always work. You can always work. You know, we. Know